weather um, problem that we had a couple of weeks ago. I think the work that the staff did uh, and the communities was absolutely fantastic and it showed the resilience of uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council and, and their, their, their communities across the region. Um, I think I always make the statement about operational and ward issues are not a matter for this, this committee and should be dealt with out with, out with the meeting. Uh, and I think that's right. So if we can leave it on a strategic basis, that would, that would be good. Um, can I ask the clerk to give us head on apologies, please? Nick. Uh, thank you, Chair. We have an apology from um, Councillor Dempster. Um, and we, at the beginning of the meeting, we have 19 members present. Liam. Chair, apologies from Malcolm Johnson. Thank you very much. Do any members have any declarations of interest? So the next item on the agenda is uh, the minutes of the meeting of the 23rd of January for approval. Agreed. Thank you. And the next uh, item on the agenda is minutes of the Harbour Subcommittee meeting 25th of January 2018 for approval. Thank you very much. Okay. We now move on to item number five, which is the Infrastructure Asset Class Capital Programme 2018-19. This report is to provide members with information on the proposed Infrastructure Asset Class Programmes for 2018-19, uh, 20, 20 and 21, and provides details of the schemes to be undertaken in 2018-19 within the Infrastructure Asset Class Capital Programme. The Head of Infrastructure and Transportation will take any questions on the report. Just, just as a, as a by, can I ask members to use their microphones clearly today? My tinnitus is playing up somewhat chronic today, so I'm, hopefully I can hear you a bit better if you speak closer to the mic. Directly, have you got anything to add to the report? Uh, nothing to add to, to the report, Chair. Just to say that I, I received a, a petition uh, in relation to the, the Tara's slip uh, uh, south of Langham and it will be our intention to report that to committee uh, in May. Uh, it was received uh, uh, after the papers had been prepared, so as I say, we'll report that to the May committee. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. If I could just maybe offer uh, one, one correction in the report and one clarification. Uh, if I could ask you to turn to page 23 and the table uh, at Appendix 1, that shows the proposed uh, 20 elements of the overall infrastructure asset class programme over the next three years. Down at the bottom, the entry that says active, tra active travel on the left-hand side should read speed limit and traffic calming, and the entry below that that says cycleways should read active travel. Uh, so there was a bit, just a bit of a mix-up in that table. Uh, it refers back to, it, now with that correction, it cross-references against Appendix 2, which is the detailed schemes under these programmes, and it cross-references back to Table 1 uh, in the text of the report, which gives the proposed budget allocation for the forthcoming financial year. In terms of a clarification, if I could ask members to turn to page 20, we've had an update at 3.51. The text mentions the Cycling, uh, Walking and Safer Streets uh, Scottish Government Award for 1819. We now know the value of that will be £204,000 uh, for utilisation on active travel. Uh, CWSS type schemes uh, so that information has come through and uh, that's that's additional for, for members information thank you thanks for that um, members Patsy um, thank you it's to do with um, forestry routes um, I uh, now part of my ward is up uh, Cars Fern Bar McClellan Way and repeatedly at every community council meeting I go to the condition of the A702 Dalry to Money Ive, which actually ends up on the A74M and the A712 Corset Newton Stewart and the A713 Castle Douglas to Air Road, there is always complaints, particularly about the A702, about the state of that road caused by timber traffic. And um, I just wonder, uh, there's nothing in here about which routes you're going to. Uh, Highlight as, as, as necessary for, for money from the from the um, the money from the Scottish Timber uh, 
fund, whatever it's called, I can't remember. But in, in, on, page, uh, on page 29, you know, forestry schemes, there's absolutely no information there. And I notice something's coming back in May, but I would like to highlight those particular roads, particularly the 702 um, is in a very bad, poor state, and it's a, a road, and it should be better than it is. Stephen? Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, it, it's something that's uh, uh, certainly on our radar in terms of the condition of the A702. There's been a number of MSP inquiries, uh, elected member inquiries, uh, and the, the team are looking at the, the state of that road. I'll raise this with the South of Scotland Timber Transport Officer uh, and the team that are putting together the bids for the, uh, the Strategic Timber Transport Fund. We say we'll come back uh, to the next committee and the details on that, but I'll ask them to look at that route as well. Uh, we have in recent years, it's an A-class road, uh, and it will be uh, an agreed route uh, for, for most of the length of it, at least. Uh, in recent years, uh, the STTF bids have allowed us to spend more of the money on, on more public roads rather than, uh, you know, kind of discrete in-forest roads. So there might be an opportunity for us there to, to, to spread some of the, the additional funding. But I'll ask them to consider that. Yeah, the director wants to come in as well now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just for members' fullest information, uh, I'm chairing the, the National UK <laughs> Timber Transport Conference in Inverness on Friday and uh, Fergus Ewing is giving the keynote speech and, and I'll be meeting him and I hope he will uh, announce further funds for the Strategic Timber Transport Fund uh, for future years. Yeah. Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Um, I missed the start of Stephen's explanation about the, uh, the transposed headings for the cycling, etc. So can I just do a clarification on page 33? Um, it's actually listed under the, the stewardry, but it is in, in, in Nithsdale. The Lockerbie Road sto stoop loaning, possible pedestrians, that will be funded out of the uh, 0.7 thousand for active travel. Yes or no? Yes, on page 33, Councillor Lever. Uh, the schemes there are proposed. That, 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 that part of the table is correct in terms of it is the active travel programme with 70,000 uh, proposed funding allocation, and that's a list of the schemes uh, that we'd be looking to, to try and take forward uh, within that funding uh, or within the future year's funding. But that's, that's the schemes that are currently on the list for, for members' uh, consideration. Yeah, because I would be concerned, you know, if we're spending all our uh, cycling, walking, and safer streets just around the hospital, because we do have problems elsewhere within the, uh, the region. Graham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just a couple of points. <coughs> Sorry. And <coughs> 3.15 Locker Railway Station. I trust that when we get this design finished, the car park will be big enough um, because we have a bad habit in the Fries and Galloway of building car parks that are not big enough. Um, and uh, I just have concerns about that. And we're trying to encourage rail travel, keep people off the roads, etc. Um, so, and uh, if we can't get the car park big enough, I hope we can put in plenty of signage to, to point to alternatives. The other point I would like to make is that <clears throat> under the uh, harbours and coastal infrastructure, uh, there's a slight drop in the funding. I happen to get involved with, with uh, uh, some, one of our harbour users in, in the Machers, um, and the uh, that subsequently led me to, to a consultation with the Harbour Master. And I am concerned that in the past, the, the dredging of these harbours used to be quite simple, quite a simple operation um, done on a sort of ad hoc basis as and when necessary. But now we have to take soil samples or silt samples, send them away. And it is also my understanding that the last silt samples we took regarding Kirkubri Harbour which is maybe the most active harbour we've got. Um, the samples were taken last May, and we got permission, finally, from SEPA or whoever it was that the samples were sent to, a fortnight past on Friday. That is a long time to wait for something like that permission to start and do the dredging. Whereas in the past, when, when, I, when I was a boy, we just put diggers into the harbour and threw the silt into the river, and it got washed away. Um, but uh, and that seemed relatively simple and relatively efficient. I wouldn't like to comment on when you were a boy, Graham, or anything like that, you know, but uh, Stephen. If I could come back on the, the Lockerbie car parks first, and it's a, a joint project uh, with Swiss Trans 
is highlighted uh, as, as a council priority in terms of the council's interest, and that's why we've made provision within, uh, started to make provision within the car parking programme. Uh, it's always been an aspiration to increase the, the availability of parking at Lockerbie, A, to, as you say, promote, promote uh, uh, modal shift and, and letting people onto the trains uh, uh, to Edinburgh and Glasgow and to points south, and also to deal with the, the issues with, with parking, people parking at the station and actually obstructing a uh, kind of movement of people and the, and the residents uh, having difficulties parking. In terms of the car park being big enough, we've, we've, there's a number of phases to the improvement works. Uh, there were works done around the immediate station. There were works done uh, about a couple of hundred yards from the station uh, in the past. And it's, it's been when we've seen areas of land that are available or existing car parks that we can squeeze more capacity out of. The works we're looking at funding in the next financial year are very much located close to the station uh, and uh, on the uh, adjacent, it's the, the car park adjacent to the, the, the northbound platform. Uh, and effectively, we're looking at relaying that, uh, or re reprovisioning that, that we can increase the capacity. It won't, it won't deal with the complete demand, and we have other sites that we're looking at on a phased basis to try and increase that capacity in Lockerbie. But we're working closely with Swiss Trans, and it's a matter their board is considering as well. Uh, we would hope to bring back more detail, both to the, the Swiss Trans board on the next phase of the car parking, uh, and also we'll bring it back to EI committee. On, on the matters of the, the harbour's funding uh, and, and the dredging samples, I know uh, Regional Harbour Master uh, Keith Armstrong-Clark uh, has had a number of uh, meetings and, and, and dialogue with Marine Scotland on how we can use their processes as efficiently as possible for a number of our small harbours, small amounts of dredging, uh, and he's certainly working with them to get some uh, um, movement on, 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 on the kind of regulations uh, or, or their interpretation of the regulations and the requirements that they do place on us. So they're very much aware uh, that that is quite an onerous uh, requirement in terms of the testing and the permissions and the licence fees, and that's something that we're, we're negotiating with them. Welcome back then. Just to say that I, I trust that you accept that eight months to get a result on a sample is unacceptable and that we're doing something as much as we possibly can to, to get that sorted. Yes, Councillor. Um, just to pick up on that, Keith, um, uh, the Harbour Master is due to meet with Director of Marine Scotland, who's actually locally based and lives in uh, Moffat, I believe, um, and to go over some of these particular issues. So it is, he has spent quite a bit of time, and I think you've spoken to him um, personally on, on this matter anyway. So, yeah, we, we agree it is uh, an awful long time to get the licences in place, but now we're getting them in place, hopefully we can uh, speed that process up. Did I hear you correctly saying that uh, he was meeting someone from Marine Scotland in Moffat? That's hardly the right place to meet somebody from Marine Scotland, is it? I'll speak more clearly, sir. Um, the director lives in of, of Marine Scotland happens to live in Moffat, so it's easy for him to get access to Kikubri. And we will take him to the harbours and give him a visit to show the challenges that we're facing, particularly at Kikubri, as you say, where we're really just casting material from the river back into the river. There's a lake in the there's a lake in the park there anyway. So anyway, uh, we have Ian and then Steve and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of small points. I think in regards to already I mentioned and alluded to by the director, three point four six. It's Glenn Tarris, Chairman. I know yourself, you, you've had a lead in regards to that, but just an update in regards to, if we could have a couple of points, I'll say them both, an update in regards to potential uh, uh, a temporary uh, availability for, for local folk, I think in particular, to be able to, be able to open that road, road up in the short term, even if it's through traffic management and such like. It's mentioned within there that looking at that certainly trying to do that, so I just wonder if, if we could hear that committee, if it is. Is that a le legitimate attempt? Ken, what's the chances, timeline, so on and so forth? And the other bit was, uh, it was actually on page, just about getting clarity, page 28, it's the, I think it's the, the million pounds worth of cards we resurface and a million pounds worth there. It's Anna Del Nesto, the very, the very top of, of the page, refers to tile kilns. I think I know what that is. I'll be farming south to Ashards, three sections, and the C61A. If we just, I mean, I'm quite sure I know where, well, they, the C61A, I'm not sure at all where that is, but the other two I think I do, but just for clarity, I wouldn't mind getting a, a more accurate uh, location. If I remember it, C61A is between Eaglesfield and Middleby. Um, the 72 is between Waterbeck and Eaglesfield. 
We can we'll, we'll pull plans together for for, for Councillor Carruthers just to show the locations specifically. Okay, thanks so much, Chair. Because obviously, I think everybody—well, it's not my ward, it's your ward, Chairman—but I think everybody in in the, in the Andale and Essel has been lobbied out those particular roads, and it's the the tile kilns. I take it that's just burn head to breaking beds. I take it that's that area. I think we may be looking at that in regards to uh, the borderlands as well. So I just so if I can, if I can get that, Chairman, would be much appreciated. But the, is there any chance of getting that road, Glentaris, even in a temporary way, reopened? If we can get an update in regards to that, so obviously we spoke about that previously. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, we, the, we have a meeting set up with the newly appointed consultant, design consultant, Fairhurst, uh, and on site. It's coming up, and th that is the principal aim of the meeting is to have a, an assessment done of the existing road, condition of the side slope, to see if it's feasible to have the road opened up on some temporary basis. But obviously, the long term aim is to get a permanent solution to open the road up full time. Can, can we ensure a small briefing goes to Ian once the, the meeting's actually had and, and yes. perhaps all members would come? Yeah. 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 A, sorry, Chair. There's a, uh, an update statement coming out to all uh, affected parties and interested stakeholders. Uh, that'll be coming out in the next week or so. So we can capture that, uh, hopefully capture that as well at the same time. Thanks very much, Chair. Much appreciated. Thank you. Stephen and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just on the back of Councillor Crothers uh, point there, I think, I think it would be helpful, given that nobody in the room seems to know where the C61A is officially, um, apart from yourself, obviously, Chair, uh, I would expect no less from you, um, but uh, it might be helpful just in the same way as the other roads have a little bit of narrative saying where they actually are. Um, I know we're, we're doing a grand job and that's probably one of the only ones that doesn't actually say anything beyond C61A. Um, the actual question is relating to the additional funding uh, the 204 k for cycling, walking and safer streets. Now, we've already got a budget allocation uh, for 210, I think it is, in that particular budget line. So I presume that's additionality um, because that's external funding. So uh, the recommendation within 3.51 on page 20 is to uh, use a sizable proportion of that to be allocated to the Dumfries Hospital project. Um, but I would presume as well that some of the other uh, projects that are on the list to do would be able to sort of use, avail themselves of some of that funding. Um, and I presume a report will come back just saying which um, programmes will be taken forward on that basis would be my first question. Uh, and the second one is also to do with the, um, the bridge uh, uh, over the water of milk. Um, Clearly, there's a piece of work there needing to be done to see whether or not that's, uh, that road effectively needs to be closed or not, and a piece of community consultation would need to be carried out. Um, when would that likely be, um, just so that reassurance can be provided to the local residents who may no longer be able to use that crossing uh, if things go a certain way? Thank you. Stephen? If I could just come in on the first, the first point, uh, Councillor, in terms of the CWSS funding, the 204,000 that I... I uh, advise members that there was, was the figure on that, and we're suggesting most of that goes to the DGRI hospitals. That is over and above the figures uh, in Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 in terms of the detail. Uh, normally what we'll do in the monitoring is we'll, we'll show a similar table to Appendix 1, but we'll show at the bottom where we have confirmed external funding uh, coming in uh, against the programmes. So that, that is additional funding over and above the programmes that uh, we've already listed uh, within that table. With respect to that, that project, uh, we hope to bring to next committee a kind of update uh, on where we're at with the, uh, the design on the project. And uh, uh, there's been a lot of work done with the team working with Sustrans, uh, and they've asked us to look at tweaking the design to make it uh, more uh, or, or better provision for cyclists and for, for walking in terms of active travel and the connections to the hospital. So we're looking at what we can accommodate there. And we reckon that if we can possibly satisfy Sustrans, that we might be looking at uh, the potential, if we bid uh, into their funding, that we could get some significant funding, co-funding from Sustrans for that, that project, uh, which again would, would release money for other council active travel projects. But we hope to update members at that, uh, on that at the next, the next committee in terms of how that design is evolving and the potential for further external funding. Stephen? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let the answer for the, the, the water and milk bridge um, come back afterwards, but in terms of the, um, 
cycling walking safer streets. So some of the projects that have been mentioned already by other members, such as, for example, in Dumfries, they could be taken forward as a result of the additional funding if if um, they're sufficient in the budget for the, the route to the hospital program, uh, as your suggestion from possibly additional external sources as well. Yes. And water milk. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, as, as we've said in the report, we're currently working up doing an assessment of various options for the bridge. Um, that's including their own inspections and su supplemented by uh, diving inspections. So there'll be a full range in terms of sort of do minimum to uh, a full reconstruction of the bridge. For, and I'll come back to committee with those range of options and costs before any further decisions are taken. Just to get a sense of when the community would need to know about this, would this be at the May committee or what sort of time scale are you talking about? I would expect we'll come back to committee first with the with, with, with to our next committee with those with, with the details of that report, and then plan out a, a program for, uh, appropriate program of consultation thereafter, depending on the option that we're looking to to, to bring to fruition. Thank you. I've got five members waiting to come in. So Jim, Richard, Andrew, David, then Sean. Thanks, Chair. On page 19, 3.48, I notice the very rapid progress of the street lighting spend to save program. My question is, have Scottish Power managed to keep pace with this program? Right. James? Can I ask in, sorry, Councillor, can I ask in which respect, in terms of their works or in terms of billing us? Thanks, James. Uh, now, it relates to a situation in Wigtown over the Christmas period when the LED lights had been put in, but unfortunately, a sizable part of the town had no lighting because the power lines had not actually been upgraded by Scottish Power. James? I mean, I'm certainly aware from working with Callum, Councillor, that um, Callum Edgar, street lighting uh, team leader, that he works very closely with Scottish Power on these because quite a lot of the works involve taking down overhead lines of theirs, uh, underground in those services, and then we're required to put new columns up and, and su su such like. And generally, that program has been successful, so I'm, I'm obviously concerned that that has, that has happened. Um, we can take this offline and discuss the implications of that, um, but also to make sure that we don't have that problem occurring in the future. But we can maybe have a, set up a meeting with Callum to discuss that uh, out with this committee, if that's OK. Richard. Thanks, Chair. Page 12 on Table 1, uh, the, myself and the independent group were very happy to see in your priorities for the for the administration a priority given to speed limit and traffic calming, especially to 20 mile an hour zones. Obviously, the, the budget there is is historic and it's not it's not going to realise our aspirations there, but perhaps we should be looking at the future to see how we can take forward those priorities, perhaps a, few, a, meet, uh, a report to a future meeting this year and how we're going to take forward the 20 mile an hour within with, within the Dumfries and Gallery would be a good thing if we could bring that forward at some time during the year. We have all undertake to do that, Richard, to come back. Uh, probably not the next meeting, but the week meeting after, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. All right. uh, Andrew? Thanks for letting me in, Chair. I'm, I'm just looking for a bit of clarity on 3.21 on page 15, um, the seawall at Kilstay Bay. Now, the second sentence in that speed paragraph says, a strategy of a strategy to prepare and protect the asset from the medium to long term is being developed. That makes sense to me. But the second half of that sentence, and we will be informed by the effectiveness of repairs undertaken to date. Can I get a bit of clarity on that, please? James? Chair, um, yes, so we've um, obviously you're, as a, you're aware of that section that there is a long length of uh, seawall that ha that's currently there. So we have undertaken over the last three years repairs to that section of seawall, including generally a rock armour approach. So what we would be looking to do is whether rock armour would be the correct approach for the remaining elements of that uh, and further north at Dye Mill, 
uh, it's Dye Mill, isn't it? Yeah, further north at Dye Mill, where there, presently there are sheet piles at the bottom of the, the slope uh, that have been lost. Uh, so whether we would we would go back into installing sheet piles, whether we would look to a rock armour approach. So it's, it's working, seeing how effective we've been. But what we've found to date is that the rock armour approach has been the most effective measure in terms of repair and speed of construction. David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, page 16, 329 of Sparling Bridge. Uh, do we have an update on the SUSTRANS funding? And is that going to be key to this project going ahead? James? Chair, um, we, we have an update in terms of funding for the Sparling Bridge in terms of design work. So the team, Michael and, and Brian, uh, have confirmed that Funding for the design element of the Sparling Bridge will be part met by uh, Sustrans. Um, because this, the replacement of the bridge is part of the flood protection scheme as well, it's eligible also for funding through uh, Scottish Government funding for flood protection schemes. Um, we would look, having done the, the design work with Sustrans funding, to make an approach to, for them to uh, fund significantly towards the cost of the structure, the actual construction of the structure as well. So they've done some really good work on getting the funding out of Sustrans. Sean? Yeah, pages uh, 25 to 34 show an extensive um, capital programme list of all the various different treatments. Um, and probably like all councillors, some of the ones that maybe we reported throughout the year haven't made that list, but would officers be able to actually provide the reserve list as well? Because we know that this programme, there will be some that won't be able to go ahead, etc., for various reasons. And whilst the reserve programme will be dynamic and it will change, I think it's useful for us to see, you know, you know what the reserve list is. You know, so is that something that can be sent round to members? Tony, anyway, you want to go, Stephen? In, in terms of reserve list, it's, it's something we've done in previous years, and uh, we, we we stopped doing because it became kind of problematic in terms of uh, public expectations. We would publish quite a long long reserve list, uh, and if schemes drop off or are, are reprioritised in future years, that, that, that could become a bit of an issue. Uh, it, it's a balance between providing uh, a very long list, because there is a lot, a lot of demand, uh, as we've reported in other reports uh, to, to, to EEI committee in terms of the, uh, the, the potential backlog figures in the carriageway condition, uh, it would it would be some very long lists. We we could certainly provide what we're thinking in years two and three, um, but, but we have we haven't done that in the past. But but stepped back from that because uh, the schemes did come on and come off, uh, and that that was proving problematic in terms of uh, kind of public feedback in terms of expectations. But it's if if that's the information members members want from us, we can we can look at that in future future years. Members happy to have a look at that in, in future. Yeah. Okay, can I just add one question? Obviously, the, the, the Homewood Avenue one is, is part of my ward, but I, I wouldn't like to take all of the, the budget uh, for that particular thing. I wonder if there's a potential to sort of half it between 2018, 19, 19, 20 for the Homewood one. That, that would leave 125,000 for smaller flood issues across the region. Would that be a potential? Yeah, that, that would be possible, and it's something we can look at, Chair, yes. Now, you know, as we go to the, the recommendations in, members are asked to approve the proposed programme budgets for our Infrastructure Asset Class Capital Programme 2018-19 in Table 1. We are, we've asked to approve the proposed three-year budget for Infrastructure Asset Class Capital Programmes in Appendix 1. Approve that. Approve the proposed list of Infrastructure Asset Class Capital Programme Projects 2018-19 report in Appendix 2. Approve that. Can 2.4, can we say, agree the inclusion of a project for flood prevention works on Homewood Avenue, along about a cost of 250k, split between 18, 19, 19, 20, so that there's 125,000 available for other small flood projects? Can we agree that? Uh, and note that the Fleet Asset Class Capital Programme will be reported separately at this committee at a future meeting. Agreed? Thank you. Sorry. Can I just ask, we got a, a, a Dockhead Junction appraisal in front of us, and I'm not quite sure whether that fits with the recommendation. I'm not... Is it coming to... I don't... And I, we haven't discussed it at all. And I presume we're happy with what the... What the, um, the 
the the the survey or the whatever the people who have been contracted to look at it, and we are agreeing that option four is what we're going ahead with. But I don't see it in the recommendations. James. So, Chair, um, Councillor, the, the, uh, paragraphs 330 uh, through 333 uh, discuss the um, intelligent transport systems, um, sorry, two, through 334, I should say. Um, where we are at this stage is we've undertaken works for, uh, through Peter Brett Associates to try and improve that junction. It's reached the end of its design life. Um, and the options that we've progressed on a technical basis are to improve the capacity. So there'll be a, a not a significant change in terms of the, 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 the operation of the junction, but by reducing uh, the, the lanes, moving the, the stop lines closer together, uh, we can improve uh, the capacity of the junction, not just for vehicles, but particularly uh, we vastly improve the, the uh, access for pedestrians. If I can just grab a copy of Stephen's report, which has got the numbered pages. Then we turn to page um, page 50 of your report, which shows the conclusions to that. And what you can see is that the queuing, there's a minor to moderate benefit. Delay for vehicles is a moderate benefit. But the delay for the pedestrians and cyclists crossing is a major benefit by uh, re-engineering the junction to reduce the number of sort of traffic islands pedestrians have to access. So. Um, from a technical point of view, this would be the, the, the preferred option. The current program is that Duncan and his team are, are working on the, uh, are looking at the design of the junction once in, in terms of the sort of civil engineering layout. And once that's done, that will be put back to Peter Brett Associates to run through their modeling to determine the, the, the actual capacity of the junction. Thank you for all right. But my question was actually, where, where were we agreeing that in the recommendations? Because we hadn't discussed it. We, we've included, Council have included that uh, report for information to, for, for members to be aware that there's some significant changes come to that junction. In terms of the design, when it's worked up, engineering design, we will come back to committee and let members see that because of the impact that it's having uh, on the town centre. Yes, I, I get back to my question. Where have we agreed to do that in, this rec in these recommendations? It's not listed within the recommendations, no. Sorry? It, it's been provided. It's not listed within the recommendations, no. I, d I don't understand. Sorry? What did you say? It's not listed within the recommendations. It's not referenced in the recommendations to the report. So why have we got it? it we provided it for members' information. It's referenced in the text of the report. We're not asking members to make a decision. We will come back with a detailed design uh, on the junction for members to review. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm flogging a dead horse here, but, um, oh dear, be careful. Yeah. And, um, and, um, but, you know, if we've got a, re a, a glossy report and we're not paying any attention to it, we're just, it's just not, it's not featuring, and I don't get the point of it being here. Greg, Greg, obviously this is for information only. There will be a report coming back forward for, for awareness that this, this junction is being looked at and there will be something coming forward in the future a future um, committee for, for recommendations for the committee to actually make. It's just to make you aware that this is something that's going to be coming forward in the future. Um, Ian. Thanks, yeah. I'm glad Councillor Gilroy raised this point because I thought it was in a later point, so it's a, a later uh, report. My view on the gas is I, I often have a heavy reliance on the gas to local members, what their input is, have they seen this. And there's a couple of things happened since there's been any real work done in this actual junction, these junctions going through is DGRI has moved, I think it's significant. And the amount of times we've heard people saying, listen, when, when these lights failed, how the traffic just flowed so much better, it made all the difference. So I just wonder, have, has, as part of the solution you've looked at here, this looks like a, a standard upgrade to the system that's in place, which I can understand. Have we thought about actually taking it, having a couple of options, <coughs> just taking these lights and such like away? Put someone else, whether it's mini roundabouts, whether it's zebra crossings, whether it's whatever. I just sitting here as a committee member, and I do play. I I, I have a, a heavy reliance in regards to the local members, and that's a fundamental part of my my consideration. So, so I mean, and John, so John can maybe add because I don't know. I'm being completely blind here, but oh, I just thought in regards to, to to the point, how much uh, have local members actually in regards to this, and is there has there been further options out with just a, a, a standard upgrade of the system? 
technology. We're actually, as I say, when you look at it, we're actually upgrading the, upgrading the lights. To be, and as I say, it's only really minor. We're doing away with one of the lanes coming up instead of going straight on down the dock to dock park and then turning up the bridge. It's being made into one. Yeah, certainly the islands are being enlarged to help with the, with the crossing. Like it's, it's really only minor alterations, like as I say, and I as a local member have no problem with them. Did I you come in? Yes, I, th I think uh, it's one thing, traffic flow, but, but the big issue at that junction is pedestrian flow and taking cognizance of pedestrians, uh, disabled, partially sighted to access from our car park at the White Sands across to the dock park. Okay, members, we, we've agreed the recommendations, but there is one action which is at the end, uh, once you have a meeting on the TARAS, the information will be shared amongst the, the thing, okay? Thank you. We can now move on to item number six, which is Economy, Environment, Infrastructure, Economic Development, Capital Projects. Um, this report provides an update on the Economic Development Capital Programme 2017-20, which was agreed by this committee on the 21st of November 2017. Uh, and the Head of Economic Development's absence, the Director and Officers will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add to that report. Uh, just, just to add, Chair, that yes, the, the Head of Economic Development is, is on annual leave and we have other uh, key staff who are on, on leave and have other commitments. So Leslie and Kerry will do their best and, and David to, to answer questions. And if there is anything that we're not sure about, we, we will respond to, to members following committee. Tommy. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just to, to welcome the report and to notice the, the progress being made in the regeneration projects, particularly within Stranra and also the waterfront uh, development, the, we have been given a tentative date of May from the director for knowing the full costs of the reinstatement of the land at, at, at the harbour. Can I get a guarantee that that, that is going to be met in the, at the May committee? Thank you, Chair. Um, the information that I've been given to report back is that the, will be a, the report is on track for the June full council. And that's the information that I was asked to present today. Um, an op the options appraisal is being redefined and the costs in relation to the East Pier, including the seawalls, are being looked at. My colleague, Michael Rosie, isn't here today um, because he has, with, an, with a colleague from Engineering Design Services, he's actually meeting with the Marine Civil Engineers. So the information is that the report is on track for June full council. So I would imagine it will come to E&I before it goes to full council, isn't it? Not convinced that that is the, the case, uh, Chair, but we'll double check that. Certainly it's uh, for full council. Okay, Andrew. Thanks for letting me in, Chair. I echo what Tommy has brought up, but my issue here is with regards to 3.2.3 Strauss and Isle Skiff project. And I've been led to believe that this is going to bring thousands of tourists to the area. And I would like to move that we actually lobby the Scottish Government for this project, well, for this um, event to be brought in as a Scottish Beacon major event. And I would like you to lobby on behalf of this committee to the Scottish Government for that, please. I'll certainly lobby on, on behalf of the SCIFs and uh, hopefully the Scottish Scottish Government will, will see it as a major event for the others. I certainly see it as a, as a major event for Dumfries and Galloway, there's no doubt about that and hopefully hopefully we'll see plenty of visitors coming into the, the area because of it. So I'll certainly get a letter off to Scottish Government on, on, on that respect. Uh, Katie and, and then Patsy. Thank you Chair. Um, I'm staying on the same subject of the Stranraer waterfront and I'm delighted to see that we've got funding in place to take the project forward and it is really exciting. However, I would like assurances from the director that myself as vice chair of the Wigton Area Committee and Councillor Sloan as chair of the Wigton Area Committee will in fact start to receive the monthly updates that were promised at the last EEI meeting. We were assured that monthly updates would be provided and as 
to date, there has been no monthly updates provided to us. So I'm just looking for some assurances that those will be forthcoming because it's really important that we are kept in the loop that this project doesn't slip or it doesn't move between large committee meetings. Certainly, it was a decision to send a, a, um, a written update on that. Right. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Hagman, my, my apologies if there's been a misunderstanding. I, I understood that, that rather than the briefings, that Jan was going to brief you personally each month. So uh, if that's not the case and there's been a misunderstanding there, my, my apologies and I will correct that. So can I have assurance that we will be getting a monthly written update? I will assure you, you get a monthly that would be written fantastic. update Thank with you. the Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Patsy, then Richard, then David James, then John. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm looking at the Dumfries um, items on, on here, and I understand the Dumfries High Street improvement um, thing because, you know, we've got Dumfries High Street. But then we move on to the Dumfries Town Centre regeneration. And I would like to know what you consider to be the town centre. Yeah. Hello. Um, the, as, as you've correctly said, there is um, a capital commitment to Dumfries High Street. Um, and what has been happening in, in the meantime is that we've been reviewing that as officers um, across the council um, because of the particular issues with Dumfries Town Centre. The way forward would be to um, look at a holistic approach to the town centre that builds on the various projects that are already happening within the town centre. And the definition of the town centre would come through uh, a process of identifying a shared vision with key stakeholders so that there is a, a, a buy-in to what we mean by the, the, the town centre as a whole. The, there is a definition in the local plan uh, local Development Plan 2 at the moment, which is a very, very tight definition, but that wouldn't take on board um, current projects such as Rosefield Mills, such as um, Moat Bray, um, and, and a, a wider breadth. So the, I suppose the straightforward answer to that is we need to work in partnership with stakeholders to get an agreed and finalised definition of the town centre. Actually. Well, if we have something in our local plan that defines what the town centre is, surely that is what the town centre is, regardless of what stakeholders want or desire. The town centre is what is in our local plan. And I do not think that it is appropriate to be then saying that we will go out to Moat Bray or Rosefield Mills because we can just alter when it suits us what Dumfries Town Centre actually is. Because if we have got that in our local plan, that is what it should be, and we should not be going beyond that. We should be concentrating on the town centre. And I don't know when we've got to this stage where it can just be a free-for-all for anyone that wants to um, crowdfund for any building or whatever else it is, and it, suddenly it becomes part of the town centre. Rosefield's miles away from the town centre. Can I? Do you want to come in? Uh, if I could just come in and see if I can add some, some clarity. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Councillor Gilroy is absolutely correct. If we've defined it in the local plan, uh, we've defined the town centre. And if we were to change the town centre, then we would have to amend the, the local plan uh, and councillors would have to be involved in, in that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my understanding. So we will look at this very carefully. But again, I think it's uh, I think it's quite right that, that we speak to sta stakeholders to see what their view is, uh, and if there is any change, then uh, that will definitely have to come back to members. Richard, thanks, Chair. On the strategic capital projects on page fifty-four, three point two seven nine high street improvements, it's good to see that we're involved in an engagement program to to see how we can further improve the high street and Island. But unfortunately, there's no. F there's no follow-up uh, capital to, to develop these ideas at the moment. So are we raising expectations or are, are the plans to include 
for the capital for the high street in Annan. Thank you, Chair. Members took the decision at the previous EENI uh, which, which projects would receive capital funding, um, and that is the position to date. Do I come in the same point? Yeah, because there was an error in, in some of the information that was given out last time that identified 300,000 for, the, for the, the high street improvements. But I think on the basis of what, what Richard is saying, um, at the last meeting we discussed the Annan Regeneration Steam Group, and the thing is, what we don't want to do is preempt the findings and the consultation, which has got to be widespread. So we haven't actually identified any budget at the moment, because there might be some quick wins that could be implemented by the council. There might be some bigger projects, but you know, we thought we'd, we'd rather actually get that consultation in first, see what's required, and then we take it from there. Just while I'm on chair as well, just for, for the next meeting as well, I think with regards to all the um, town centre uh, regenerations and areas that have been regenerated, I think Jan had agreed to go away and look at a, a special purpose vehicles that would be taken forward to deliver these, uh, and that would include and ensure that there was um, widespread community and uh, local, local elected member involvement so it's maybe just for the next meeting once Jan's back is you can maybe give us an update on on what she's been doing with regards to that piece of work okay thank you David yeah. James yeah. and then John oh, it's just I think I'm meant to do and gloom about down for his town centre I think it's quite a good news story that the council uh, application for uh, 600k for Moat Bray was successful and that allows that project to continue and I think they try and say Moat Bray is out with the town centre is a bit pulling the line a bit much like maybe Rose, Rosefield Mills is a wee bit like over the other side of the bridge but it's still pretty near town, the town centre and it's no two or three mile away. <coughs> Richard? Yeah just quick come back on what we're talking about uh, just clarification, the £17,000 that's in for this year, is that for the, the study or is it for quick win things that we can do in Annan? And the other question is, when, can, when will we get another opportunity to uh, include for the capital for the high street in Annan? In a, uh... Thank you, thank you, Councillor. The overall budget um, that has been identified for Annan is as previously stated. The 17,000 was a carry forward figure. Um, it's an, account, an, accountancy, an accountancy figure. The funding has been identified for the High Street Improvement Project um, to pay for the, the, res the research and the um, body of evidence that will be forthcoming from that. In respect to your second question, I'm not in a position to be able to comment on the funding. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, it's just, I suppose, now to echo uh, Councillor Martin's um, uh, recognition of the value of the 600k um, funding. Uh, obviously, that doesn't actually have an impact on our budget because I think it's just we, have, we are the lead authority and we have to make the application on behalf of the project. So that's a good news story, I think. Uh, however, I think Councillor Gilroy makes a, an interesting point just about what is the town centre. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there, w there are projects that in and around the periphery of the town centre will be in the holistic sense a benefit to the town as a whole and the experience of people living and visiting there but I think it is worth maybe getting a wee bit of clarification on you know if we've got an LDP and we've got a town centre that's recognised then we need to be uh, at least consistent and afford a mechanism by which projects in and around the town centre can then bid to become part of that maybe in future and or add as a kind of one of our council's agreed policies something that's going to improve the the holistic town centre. So there's maybe a wee piece of work, a clarification that would be done there. I would, I would agree with that. I yeah. think. The, I think the director says we'll, we'll do that piece of work. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Councillor Thompson, and, and the point made absolutely. by Councillor Gilroy. Absolutely, uh, we'll clarify that, and I'll, I'll write to, to, to each of, of the members in the EEI. John, on that point, at the communities for the town centre living fund, they have actually identified what they're actually classing as the town centre for Dumfries and in Lockerbie and all the towns in the area. I, I think it'd be useful to have that information for shared, so John, that, that, that's 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 the. It's only coming to the next to the com community's meeting in a fortnight's time. Okay. You know, the members will go to the recommendations. Members, uh, we've asked to note two point one and two point two, and again. Thanks very much for that 600k. We're looking forward to it. Okay.
Okay, members, we're going to item number seven, which is the Renzi Galloway Coast Path. Um, this report presents members with a review of the development stage of the Renzi Galloway Coast Path, the Renzi Coast Path, which culminated in the submission of the stage two bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund or on the 23rd of February 2018. This report provides a draft overview of the content of the stage two HLF bid and the funding package for the delivery of the project, the service manager environment. We'll take any questions on this report, unless you've got anything to add to it, Director. Nothing to add, Chair. Thank you. Anything to add? Members, um, Katie. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm really delighted to see this. And as somebody who sits on the Outdoor Access Forum, I've been lucky enough to get updates from Brian through that particular vehicle. Um, I just wanted to slightly add just take it to the side slightly and talk about the core path budget that's mentioned in 3.4. Um, you've got that the core path budget has been match funded of 157,200. Can I ask what is the budget for that? And also, have we got any updates in terms of core paths as to the situation at Bladna? Because obviously that has been a previous situation and is that fully resolved now? Simon. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the, the budget that's outlined in, in section 3.4, um, the core path budget um, is part of the capital budget that's been approved um, previously on item 4 in terms of the capital allocation. So we have a, a small allocation being put towards the RINS project as match funding from the council perspective over the next three years to, to match and to draw down the, the million pounds nearly that we're, that we're looking at from external sources. So that, that is in place through the capital budget and obviously we are working within the budgets we have available to us. In relation to Bladnock, um, we will be bringing another report back to committee in May that will outline obviously issues at Bladnock, but happy to talk about that offline. Andrew. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, Chef, for that then. Um, I've got questions around, are we currently in communication with community councils and community groups at this stage so as they can bring the likes of the heritage and the history of the area as we go around? Because I know that the likes of Kirkham Community Council are really keen to get involved with this and put their stamp on their little section of the, of the path. Simon. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, there has been a steering group established um, that's met several times to look at how we can take that forward. And as far as I'm aware, there has been engagement with, uh, with relevant sort of community councils through some of the engagement work that we've done through some of the consultants. I'm happy to have further engagement, and obviously through Brian, who's been leading this, happy to get further meetings set up to look at how we can maximise the benefit locally. Happy to use our money as well, Rose. Thank you, Chair. Um, I greatly um, welcome this report and all the hard work that's gone into it. And actually, I was going to echo Councillor Juicy's remarks that um, when we go round to community councils, they are all very keen to, to be involved in that. Um, it is very much a, a good news story. And um, regarding the developments in Stranra and all the, all the developments that are happening, I would like to um, request that we have an EEI in Stranra. Thank you. I think, obviously, the, the, the full council who made decisions about having a full council <coughs> made a decision about where we actually hold meetings. I think that, that there are issues across EE and I about, you know, um, having a visit to, for instance, the Sunra waterfront projects um, and things like that. I wonder, Alistair, if it would be appropriate to have a special EE and I meet about the waste in Sunra, but also visit Sunra on the day for the, the, the project plus the zero waste site as well, because that was something we were supposed to do last year. I think if, we, if we're already across here, we may have that, that particular meeting on the waste side of things uh, there as well. You get your advice on that. Uh, uh, okay, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, anything's possible. And uh, I, I think uh, if there were to be an EEI meeting, uh, in Stranraer, I'm sure uh, local members would, would wish to have something on the agenda about the projects that we're carrying out there, for example, uh, Stranraer Waterfront, etc. And we could certainly, uh, depending when it was, have an update uh, on, on the waste PFI, but uh, there are many things. Well, I didn't not, mean the waste PFI, right, we were supposed the, to have a special waste, meeting on the whole waste issue. On the whole waste issue, right. Uh, well, we can see if that all matches up uh, uh, 
on a date, we can arrange a meeting out there. It would, it would depend when it was, and it would depend how we could prepare papers and what information we had at the time. Okay. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Right. Katie, then, and did Andrew want to come back in there? Did you want to come back in there? Well, Chair, I was just going to support um, what Councillor Sotis was putting forward, uh, but I agree with that if we're going to have a Shinra based meeting, if we can have a special meeting for Wigton Shinra issues and perhaps the, the waste issues that we have, especially the fact that we are the only curbside recycling point in the region, I think that would be a good focus. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in on this. Um, it's just in terms of the coastal path, which is Fantastic. It's such a positive project and actually it's one that will put Dumfries and Galloway on the map. I was just wanting to ask, is there any plans to promote this as a destination for those wishing to do Duke of Edinburgh Awards facilities, for example? There's no reason why people can't get the train from Glasgow down to Stranraer straight on and actually we could be an international destination for children and young people across Europe to come to actually use this path as an option for Duke of Edinburgh Awards and other outdoor activities. Simon? Right, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I think as, as, as Councillor Hagman's identified, obviously the infrastructure and the proposed project will provide further opportunities. Um, it's hoped, obviously, as part of the, the promotion of the, the route went up and running and obviously the offices that we're looking as part of the project that we can explore opportunities as to how we can maximise the benefit, um, not just for sort of the RINs and Stranra, but obviously for the region as a whole. Good on then, David. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, I welcome this Lindsay Galloway coastal part. It's a lovely part of the country. Um, it's a fairly exposed part of the country, and we can gather up the money for, for building these things or setting them down. Um, there will be a degree of erosion, and I'm concerned about how we maintain it once it's in place. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, as, as, as identified, obviously it, uh, it does get some rather inclement weather, um, to, to say the least. Obviously what we're looking at in terms of the actual design proposal, we've been working over this over the last five years, working very closely with landowners to try and define the right route to ensure that we can minimise erosion where possible and use the right medium in terms of sort of the, the, the construction. Um, obviously maintenance is, is going to be an issue. We will undertake maintenance as we can throughout the, the, the lifespan of the project, but it's anticipated that if we use the right construction mechanisms, we can obviously reduce the maintenance burden as we as we progress. Do we have a fund, a maintenance fund for these for these these paths, these core paths? Um, we have the the ongoing sort of core path um, allocation through the capital part at this moment in time, which can be used obviously to to undertake sort of significant sections of maintenance as required. David, then Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm at 311, um, and I've heard reference to a south of Scotland coastal path on at least two occasions. Um, uh, my question is, is that a, a different concept, or are we just, as usual, watering down our brand identity by choosing lots of names for our area? Um, and we going into the, the detail here, um, it's been an ambition for several years, a study carried out by SNH. Um, it focused on the Mull of Galloway, Port Patrick, or could be Gatehouse Fleet. Um, was there a reason for that? Um, is it not feasible to have a complete path? Are there already existing paths in the other parts? Uh, is there a report um, that they made that one can see? Simon. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the southwest coastal path, um, many years ago when the, the Land Reform Act was first sort of developed, um, one of the, the key requirements from one of the local MSPs was to look at whether there could be a full Scotland coastal path to reflect what's happening south of the border in terms of the, the coastal path that's been developed as part of the, the, the DEFRA submission. Obviously, the, the challenges we have here are slightly different to, to sort of south of the border. We have looked at key sections of the coastline that we have within DNG and have identified areas where we feel we can get quick wins or funding packages to create significant routes that would be beneficial. We are committed to exploring and taking that further to look at whether we could actually get a complete and continuous coastal path, but there are some sections within the region such as Dundrennan um, and sort of the, sort of the, the some of the, the military ranges around sort of uh, 
the uh, sort of further down towards the Maccas around Wick Bay that are going to cause a few issues. So we are looking at that. But this presented an opportunity with the Rins coastal path to create a continuous sort of circular route that tied into existing infrastructure built on our core paths that we already have. And we have a duty to obviously take forward and a priority to take forward um, to provide as much of a route as possible. I believe there is a study. Um, I shall find the study and, and pass that to you sort of offline with relation to obviously the work that's been undertaken for the Southwest Coastal Path in conjunction with SNH. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. It's to ask in 3.5.1, the third bullet point, <coughs> if you could expand on the publicity and communications officers to develop suitable materials on a range of different media platforms. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, what we're, we're looking at here is that we're aware that, uh, you know, traditionally some of the interpretation that's been undertaken has been sort of in situ site boards. Um, we're looking at obviously how we can actually bring in sort of, you know, the use of mobile technology apps, um, obviously looking at websites and how we can use these for international promotion as well. So it's not looking at just one, uh, one particular form of media. We're trying to obviously be as, as, as future proofing as we can to ensure that obviously some things that go in can be updated with minimal cost in the future. Are we also then looking at uh, having chips along the route so that you get information when you're going past the various destinations on that route? Okay. Yeah. I believe it's been something that we're looking at, either something that you, you can download prior to doing the walk or something that actually will be prompted by, by electronic markers along the route. Sean? Yeah, it's maybe some information that Sam can provide out with the meeting, but I was just interested when he was talking about the National uh, Coastal Path and, and efforts in England as well. But the first, you know, in Dumfries and Galloway, the first part over the borders is at Gretna, and between Gretna and Annan, obviously, has been lauded before as potential, but that was stopped because of the MOD site, which is now being decommissioned. So I'd be interested if that figured in, in, in his ideas. Uh, and also what progress could be made with the MOD now that it's a decommissioned site and that opens up that potential to have not only a, a national coastal path that's linked through Dumfries and Galley but links up with the, the English coastal path. Simon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my understanding is that um, work that DEFRA are doing at this moment in time will take, obviously, the Cumbrian section to Gretna. Um, in terms of further engagement with the MOD, we have had initial discussions around East Rig. Um, we're aware that there are wider considerations that need to be taken into account, but we are exploring opportunities and obviously happy to discuss, um, you know, those particular developments. Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's really just a, a comment to offer my sympathy for the members in the West. I think there's definitely something to be said for having some kind of a uh, meeting that's relevant to the strategic uh, projects surrounding the Stranraer as the second largest uh, uh, town in the region, um, so that people there can get a more direct experience of the workings of a local democracy as it happens. So um, it was just really to add that comment. I mean, if there is a way that that can be done, I'm sure Alistair's already got some ideas in mind about that. Okay, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll take that into consideration as I say before we look at that, look at that particular um, waste and have a look at some of the projects across here as well because it was something we were supposed to do last last year. Okay, members, we've got the recommendations. We are asked to note 2.1, note 2.2, note 2.3, agree 2.4 and agree 2.5. Agreed? Thank you. Chair, just, we're, we're by the recommendation, sorry, choose over here, but just in regards to how will we get the feedback in regards to the local democracy point or having a meeting in Stranraer over that way? Will that just be a, a feedback and email or should it be implicit within the actual recommendations? We will email out to members as soon as we get that in. Okay. If, if it's acceptable to email, uh, acceptable to members, uh, I will discuss with governance uh, and email uh, members and advice. Thank you, because I remember when we put this into place, it was always an option, if required. Okay, members, we're now going on to um, item number eight, which is one-year funding agreement from Fusion Gallery Council and Visit Scotland. To the page. Okay, this, this report outlines the changes suggested by Visit Scotland. The tourism, marketing and communications as well as how information will be provided for and sourced by visitors to the region in the forthcoming year. This report also seeks agreement for the Fishing Gallery Council and the Council to enter into a one-year agreement with Visit Scotland to provide marketing and partnership activities for 2018-19 
and to provide members with the detail of the proposed minute of agreement between the Council and Visit Scotland. The service manager business and enterprise will take any question unless you've got anything to add to it, Director. Nothing to add to the report, sir. Thank David, you. anything to add to it? Jim. Thanks, Chair. Uh, 3.5.1 at the top of page 76. Have we any information about the relative effectiveness of the different modes of advertising? Hi, Chair. Um, we have actually had a couple of sessions with Visit Scotland for, for members uh, over the last six months, um, and I can send you a copy of that presentation, uh, which will give you some of the impact analysis in terms of the return on investment, um, which I think was about £9 for £1 uh, investment. The advertisement in that is quite a traditional type of marketing. Um, a lot of it is posted, which is also followed up by email. Um, so Visit Scotland do take quite a bit of research on a, a quite a traditional marketing campaign that they do take a place within the um, memorandum of agreement, which also complements the online activity, which they do on a national basis. Jim? Basically, I'm trying to establish which method of advertising is most effective. Okay. But I, think, I think in a lot of cases it depends what age you are, Jim, because there's a lot of people yeah. going to apps and, yeah. uh, and some people like magazines, you know, I think, yeah. I'm not sure if that's yeah, an there, answer. There's an absolute, you know, there's a mix. So Scotch, uh, Visit Scotland um, have their national website, do a lot of tweeting, a lot of um, social media posting, uh, which is relevant for a particular market segment. And at the same time, we also do some traditional offline marketing. So there's a, there's a mix in terms of that approach. David, James. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I welcome the fact we've got a report here with a little bit of a breakdown uh, as to what uh, Visit Scotland do with the money, because I've seen or been in one or two conversations where people were asking, well, if we didn't pay, uh, would they still do it? But clearly they do try to market our area with that budget. Um, the administration's um, budget contained a measure to spend £65,000 or so attracting motorised travellers from Northern Europe. Uh, I've known a few of them. They'll gleefully spell, spend uh, £65,000 on their machine, putting in all sorts of self-sufficiency aids, and then boast about how little they spend um, when they travel. And, um, and uh, they don't really care when they're sort of blocking up minor roads. But I suppose it was a sort of feeble... Uh, effort to do something and to say that you could do something for the economy. But really, when I look at the title or, of what we're doing here, economy, environment, infrastructure, economy, first word here, and I actually don't see that we're making much effort at all. I think we need to be ashamed of ourselves, the people sitting around the tables here, about our economic performance um, locally. And um, I, I didn't see where else to come in in the debate with this con. Uh, these comments because there's actually uh, nothing in here that's of economic significance. So I'd, if I could just, uh, there's lots of things I think we should do, but I won't um, bore you with that. And some people will be bored because they always think the state should take control of everything. But there are a few enlightened people, maybe in the room, who might um, think about should we be doing something, something more. So um, one, my one point today is the economic ethos through the whole council. And I'd just like to when there's three small things that I've observed. I've observed um, three people coming to, to planning and um, wanting to, to invest um, money and um, being told, well, I'm only through, that's going to be tricky. Well, you better look at our website. And these were people who were from Germany. And there wasn't a thought there that, oh, they might be um, diverted to business gateway. Um, and, you know, that kind of joined up thinking within the council would re really help. And... Um, or, or schools. The schools are, are trying to drive everybody away, away to the Central Belt uh, universities, etc. But they're not, they're not making the pupils aware at earlier ages that they're actually um, unfilled uh, apprenticeships in engineering in, in our area. So they're not really buying into the Dumfries and Galloway um, part of it. And, um, or I looked at um, Enterprise DG working on a, a library refurbishment for weeks, and um, the site manager allowed uh, the subcontractors to park 
um, out with the controlled area. They'd sectioned off a really big section to put the one skip in, but he let he let five or six vans park in that. David, in this can area. I ask you a question? What's this well, got to do with a one? I would like to know whether there's any point in being on this on this committee because is this committee going to fulfil its obligation to do something for the economy or not? That's my question. Thank you for your time, Chair. I think this administration is doing quite a lot for the, the economy of this particular area in, in Scotland. Dumfries and Galloway has seen some real improvement in using their SMEs. You mentioned apprenticeships. We've, we've, we've put funding into the potential for apprenticeships over that particular period of time. What has got to do with a one-year funding agreement with Dumfries and Galloway Visit Scotland is beyond my recognition. Because at the end of the day, this is about a one, the council and um, any something and that brings in jobs as well, because tourism is a big factor in Dumfries and Galloway. Okay, you might not agree, you might not agree that tourism is a big factor and it could be better, and I wish it is. You know, at the end of the day, but what, what, what are you talking about? You're gone. Please. Thank you for the opportunity to clear my point. No, I think we should be spending uh, much, much more to attract people to say it's a wonderful area. I was uh, totally shocked when I came back here. A few visitors we have. Uh, there are some in the, in the middle season. And... Um, I didn't have a chance to bring up my general point that we should be doing more in any other part of the document here, because this document, as always, does nothing to do any um, big game-changing developments that would actually help our, our rental or local economy. I mean, how many people are finding prosperity here? Not very many, and I agree it's a bit of a, um, a big point to bring up when we're just talking about Visit Scotland here. But when are we going to discuss it? And when are we going to have an economic plan to do something for the people here so that young people could have a chance to stay or return, have a decent job, career opportunities here? David, you want to come in on that? Yeah. Um, obviously, the paper here is uh, in relation to the arrangement with Visit Scotland for the £130,000. Um, as a side note, in terms of like uh, your, your discussion, Visit Scotland actually have uh, procured some extra marketing money for the region, for the south of Scotland, which will be spent over the next two years. So there'll be additional money put into the pot separate from this. And at the same time, we're also working with the new agency in terms of that, the whole tourism offering. So there is a lot economically going along. Some of that can't be disclosed at this stage because it's still been worked up. But I can assure you there is a lot of additional um, targeted support for the tourism sector going on. Patchy, then Ian, then Rachel. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking at page uh, 79, which is um, to do with the executive summary and um, the area activity results of, which are really a year out of date because I see the activity for the period of 1st of April to 31st of March 2017. But I'd just like to know, I'm looking at the recent highlights slash res results, and the reach and the landings, which I imagine, I mean, I don't know where those words come from. It's a very strange way of putting it, but anyway, it sounds like fishing. But anyway, um, and I just wondered, you know, if you're putting out over 12 and a half million and you're landing 11,000, is that a good response? I have no idea whether that is what you'd expect or whether, um, I don't know whether, you know, you give the figures, but I have no idea as to whether that's a good result or not. David? Yeah, uh, that's obviously Visit Scotland National's web website, and I think they're um, quite happy with the figures, and you see the level of engagement with it. And as we already mentioned, there is a diverse range in terms of the marketing. Um, one of the things we are also looking at is, um, from a more regional perspective, about the engagement um, for clients out with the Visit Scotland website uh, to when they come to the south of Scotland, actually where do they land? So we are looking at... Um, additional uh, online facilities for clients to provide um, information about what's going on in the area, places to visit. So that is something that's actually been considered just now. On to that. So, we, yep. well, so that's general visit Scotland. If we go to page 91, it's to do with D&G golf pages. And is that a, a reasonable um, result from the the reach of Nine million, and we have five thousand landings. I'll get some feedback from Visit Scotland uh, for you. Again, that's the national website for it, but I'll get some feedback in terms of the breakdown and the analytics behind that. I, I don't want loads of statistics. I just would like to know if what's being done is actually what you'd expect to get back, because it doesn't seem it seems quite low to me. But I don't. I'm not an expert in any of this at all. So it's just 
I'm just raising the point, sure. you know, whether we're, we're, we're getting we results don't, we, we should yeah, be getting. So, yeah, so we don't have control of that, uh, that website, so that's directly on the hits from Visit Visit Scotland, but I will get some feedback that I can send to you separately on it. And the other thing, just out of interest, who sits on Visit, Sco Visit South West Scotland? I'm not familiar. Uh, so we attend uh, all of the Visit Scotland, uh, South of Scotland uh, agency meetings. Um, so they're every six months. So yeah, are any of the stakeholders yeah. on Visit South West Scotland? Yes. 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 So it's part of the um, tourism trade, yeah? Yes, Ian, absolutely. Ian, Richard and Andrew. Simple question for me, Chairman, at 3.5.1. Uh, just try to understand where these financial figures come from. It talks about a, an autumn winter uh, direct mail shot reaching 32,000 homes and the press and digital activity reaching 2.61 million. I take it that's homes or people, not just sure. It goes on to say this activity generated 855,800. And it gets the same again in spring and the exact same figures are alluded to. Looks a, a wee bit like a software program. Uh, so I just wonder in regards to that, what's the kind of workings out behind that? What hard evidence have we got to say that that was the actual economic impact in Dumfries and Galloway on both times? David? So as I alluded to earlier on, um, uh, the kind of postal stuff is then followed back uh, by emails and then they actually contact the clients to see if they've actually visited, visited the area and to calculate the spend. So that presentation was issued out to everyone. Uh, and I can reissue it if you, do, if you still don't have a copy of it. And that return on investment was £9 for every pound spent. I, just, I mean, I'm, what I'm highlighting in particular, Chairman, I think is it's the exact same for the winter, the two terms that's come out. It's too, it's kind of, it, it just doesn't add up to me. It just, it's too superficial. It, it's like a software program that, rather than what's actually really happened on the ground. And I, so I seen it in black and white there, but what is the hard evidence that actually says that that was the economic impact. I know you're referring to different documentation, but I just, it doesn't look, it's, it, it's not, it isn't actually believable to me when I see that. David, so okay. when, when you look at the income generated for the spring, summer and, and the winter, autumn, it was exactly the same. How, how did they get to that calculation? I'll, I'll get uh, Visit Scotland to give me some clarity on how they, they made the calculations and send it to him. Andrew Wood. Thank you, Jerry. It's on a similar sort of line, really. It's uh, trying to understand the commissioning process of these various campaigns. The, there must be, I take it, a, a commissioning process, and that would then bring you to your final figures that you've got here in the last box. And if we could get some more information on that, I find that very helpful. <coughs> With regard to the South of Scotland, Visit South of Scotland organisation, I understand that that's a fairly new organisation that's been set up by Visit Scotland as an arm's length body, is that correct? No, the, the, the marketing, uh, Visit Scotland uh, and, uh, marketing group has been going for the last number of years. Uh, so it meets every six months uh, with um, representat representations from the, the kind of tourist sector. So there's hotels, bed and breakfast, visitor attractions who all attend that regularly. Just for clarification, so it's really just over to the west that we're talking about, and it's not the whole of Dumfries no, and Galloway? No, it's the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. <coughs> just, there's another organisation yeah. that has recently been set up in my neck of the woods, mm -hmm. you know, mid and up in Isdale. Um, I forget what the, I think it's actually up in Isdale Forum, Tourist Forum. Are they involved in any shape or form? Um, they may have, I, I'm, I'm not aware of them, to be honest. And how many other organisations are like that out there that are not connected within the whole... Well, the whole, the whole point profile? of this, the whole point of having the regional print is to bring everybody together. So if there are separate ones, it is, they all come to, or all should be attending the uh, the one which we host as part of the, the South West. Um, so if there are kind of splinter groups, I'm not always aware of, of what they are, but Visit Scotland don't attend the splinter groups. They have the main attendance at the main group in the, re the region. Okay, Stephen, Richard, and then David. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I think this, some of this report is a bit kind of hard to read because it's very much uh, focusing on the finger pointing at the moon rather than the moon itself. Uh, so you've got um, 
and again, Councillor Gilroy touched on it just in terms of what does the, what's the meaning of the, the number of impressions in relation to the number of engagements or the number of, um, I think fundamentally what we're interested in is, is there a true uh, correlation between the amount we invest in this and the number of visitors that are actually spending money in the region? Uh, it does, and Councillor Carruthers picked up on it just in terms of the last paragraph, uh, sorry, 3.51, where it talks about the, this 855,800 additional to the region's economy based on activities and I appreciate you've said you'll bring back information specific as to what that means because it does look suspiciously similar for both periods but uh, it's really to get that assurance and if we can have input into the direction to visit Scotland to say listen can we focus more on those uh, activities that actually have a higher yield of engagements or click-throughs or bookings rather than just um, uh, the number of impressions because I appreciate that paper uh, that type of advertising, you pay a certain amount for a number of impressions, but clearly 1% or half a percent uh, return on investment is not very high in terms of the clicks. So uh, are we able to input at this, um, as a result of this report into uh, Visit Scotland's strategy to say, can we specifically target on the Facebook engagements, for example, where the yield is higher? Absolutely. Um, and we did, as I said earlier on, we did have two two sessions before uh, with Visit Scotland four members, one in Kirkcubri and one here, which was an opportunity for members to discuss with Visit Scotland actually the delivery model and get some feedback on the impact analysis that you're talking about. Um, but I, I'll get you a copy of that presentation. But yes, the um, the MOA is flexible because obviously what we want to do is make sure we get the maximum return on our investment. Richard and then David. Yeah, going back to what Councillor James was saying, I don't know whether he's, he's an enlightened person with liberal values or whether he's emburdened with with uh, Neolithic ideologies. But, but we'll come from different points of view, but I think we're saying the same thing because there is a frustration that we want to do more to promote the region, but there really isn't really the time within the constraints of meetings to do that. So... Uh, uh, with the budget we've got for Visit Scotland, it's only a very small budget. It's not going to make a dent, make a big dent in things. And we're, we've got this event strategy, which we should be promoting to the rest of Scotland and the rest of the country. But we're, we're not doing that. We're not doing that at national level. Uh, I wrote to the leader a couple of weeks ago saying well, there's an Expo 18 going on in Glasgow, but the Fries and Galloway Council is not there to support the businesses which are trying to promote the Fries and Galloway. I don't know if we've... We've decided to be present at that because I certainly asked asked for that if we could be could be present there. Uh, so there is frustration. We, we have to promote the fishing gallery more. Uh, I see Councillor James is keen to get involved in that. Perhaps perhaps we can have another forum where where the the members can get together and say this is these are the ideas we want to push forward to promote the fishing gallery. We want to visit this work with this new forum to visit. Southwest Scotland, which is a, which is an independent group of, of local businesses to work with them. So perhaps we could uh, try a, a forum and see how that went. Rather, we had a pr definitely had a presentation from uh, Visit Scotland, but we need to get our heads together as a councillors and see what else we need to do to promote the region. David, yeah. Um, in terms of the expo event, yes, yeah, certainly certainly aware of that. I think the reason we haven't taken that up, albeit. It has been promoted by Visit Scotland to a number of businesses who want to take stands and they had the opportunity to, to do that. We, at the present time, don't have the mar marketing collateral to underpin it and go to an event such as that. So we actually have to get our product offering and our marketing collateral in line before we can take on an event like that to promote the Fries and Galloway. Would it be possible to have another seminar along with, with, with the, the group that you mentioned? Just to see, bring some ideas from members if they were invited to that particular thing. Um, um, more, more than happy to arrange another meeting with Visit okay. Scotland who are very accommodating and going through the stats, going through the hits on their website and the statistics and get that arranged for you. Okay, David. Thank you, Chair. Visit Scotland are a terrific organisation which publicises Scotland. And I think that's the crucial thing here. It's Visit South West Scotland that needs the support. They're a volunteer group who have very little funding. They're struggling to raise 10 or 12,000 pounds 
to do some sort of promotion for Dumfries and Galloway. I think we should give Visit Scotland the money that we give them, and I would have given them more, not a lot more, but perhaps uh, attached a caveat to that so that we had a wee bit more input into what we're asking them to do. But I think we should be focusing on Dumfries and Galloway. We should be focusing on, focusing on a destination development document that we can build our tourism sector in Dumfries and Galloway. I don't think Visit South West Scotland would disagree that they need help and they need financial help to do that. And I think that's something that the Council should be looking at. David? Okay. Um, yeah, Visit Scotland are a national organisation, but the memorandum of agreement we have is for the 100% focus of that money being spent about promoting our region. Hence, last year we produced four films, which again were demonstrated at the sessions to give you a feel for the kind of product. I already mentioned as well that um, Visit Scotland have been given additional money out with this MOA uh, from the Scottish Government, which will be for the promotion of the South of Scotland. So, yes, we are trying to encourage and motivate them to have a focus about getting more visitors to this region and to spend more money in their local economy. Okay, Vice Chair and then David. David. Thank you. Sorry, Graham. OK, hey, just a point of uh, information, and that is that back in 2012, I think it was myself and Visit Scotland, we did go to Expo, and we did, in actual fact, we won a trophy for having the best stand in that particular year. So it's not as though we can't do it, and it was a very worthwhile event. And we brought down a lot of people from that particular uh, exhibition, came down to the area and visited various sites. So it is something that we should be looking at doing an awful lot more of, and I totally agree with what's been said. Thank you for that. We'll certainly have a look into that. Okay. Liam. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I have concerns with, 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 with no concerns with Visit Scotland, but I have concerns with what we pay them and what other authorities pay them um, to get an equal bit of uh, publicity or an equal bit of, of, of uh, input. And uh, why are we paying a relatively large sum of money in the shape of it was 170,000, it's now been reduced to 130,000. Um, well, that's a proposal. And what the other authorities uh, do, what do they pay? Um, because, and do they get any less service for that money or for the lack of money? And by us, you, you give us a, a figure of £9 for every pound we, we put into Visit Scotland. So we're now reducing the potential of bringing about £360,000 to Dumfries and Galloway by reducing it by... £40,000. The other thing is that Councillor Brodie did have the opportunity to vote for more money in, 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 the, in the budget um, to go into tourism because we were going to put an extra £200,000 into tourism to promote Dumfries and Galloway and Councillor Brodie chose to vote the other way, so it's his own fault. Well, can I just say that the, the budget's already been agreed at full council for the 130,000 yeah. to go to visit Scotland. Yeah. That, that is, I don't know what, what we are compared to what yeah. other regions within yeah. Scotland. Uh, the the 40,000 uh, which has been stripped out was actually used for films, so the films are now in situ, so actually the spend in terms of physical marketing uh, out to customers is exactly the same amount as it was last year. Um, there are a, a complete variations in terms of the amounts that are spent by different local authorities. Um, some people don't give it to visit Scotland, uh, but probably have their own uh, kind of like tourist boards, but they're spending over a million pounds per annum. The other thing is that visit Scotland hold the database of the client information. We don't have a database, so if we're marketing out, we don't know who we're marketing out to because we don't have that that uh, that data integrity. Okay, John, and then David. Chairman, I want to just get up. So I really do apologise for this, but because I, I missed the first piece of what was said there in regards to. Did I hear they said it was, this is the same amount what was spent with Visit Scotland last year as this year? Is that correct? 170,000 was the agreement last year, 40,000 of which was for films. So the films have now been produced, so that's been stripped out, taking you to a net figure of 130,000. So the 130,000 pounds is the same amount of money which was spent in terms of what is detailed in the programme there. Okay, John. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I was at the last um, meeting of Visit South West Scotland in the Arden House Hotel in Kirkubri, 
There are about 500 owners of holiday accommodation, B&Bs, self-catering, or they provide services to the to tourism trade. They pay about £50 a year for membership. They're very enthusiastic. I think they feel they're not well served by Visit Scotland, so they've started their own, this organisation several years ago. It, it continues to grow. As I said, they provide their own web page, their own leaflets, and I think they were the first people to provide and consider tourist routes such as food routes in the southwest of Scotland. Okay. And I would just support the um, Council Inglis. I think the Council should be supporting Visit Southwest Scotland as well as Visit Scotland. If it was part of the recommendations, then maybe we'd in it. But David, David, um, did you want to come back in? Thank you. Yeah, yeah so I think the, the money that we're giving Visit Scotland is a percentage of what, it, what tourism is worth in the Fries and Galloway is, is a pittance. Yeah, I think the amount of money that we're putting into tourism needs to be seriously looked at. We need to be working more closely with local organisations and investing more money in that. Yeah, the point Councillor Wood made, the Vice Chair, yeah, regarding piggybacking yeah, Visit Scotland at Expo would have been one of the caveats I would have put on to add extra money in there, yeah, trying to get delegations onto these yeah, things like the Expo or any tourism. Yeah, um, Organisations like that. The, the budget has been agreed at full, full council. Mm -hmm. Members, I'm going to go into the recommendations. Um, one more chance, David. Thank you. Um, I, I welcome your recognition um, that uh, tourism is a vital part of our economy. I'm a bit disappointed that you think our economy is doing relatively well. Um, I would like to ask you that since the tourism is so important, and maybe off the back of that, food and drink, that following a destination development plan, um, and it's the only chance to grow our economy, really. Wouldn't it be appropriate to spend about 1% of our budget on marketing this area? And can't you see that, that would make a, it's just a tremendous difference to, to where we are? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the estimate, we didn't... Um, Excuse me, but let's, let, that would be a decision taken in another, another area. This is not for this. I'm going to go into the recommendations. Members are asked to agree that Fishing Galloway Council enters into a one-year agreement with Visit Scotland for the provision of market and partnership activities for 2018-19 with a budget of 130000 as outlined in section 3.7. We agree that. Thank you. What I've heard is a, um, a lot of moaning, but what's obvious as well from what the officer has said is, you know, there has been attempts to engage with the members uh, and because that engagement isn't taking place with as many councillors, there's a little bit of ignorance of what's been happening. So it's maybe not the fact that there's not a lot happening, it's just because there's an ignorance there that, that you know, they, they haven't had the opportunity to actually find out what's going on. So I'd urge them to actually go along to the to the seminar that's got to be organised. Yeah, I suggest I think we have, we have another seminar where members can see what's actually happening within the year and if, if people would like to make themselves available for that that, that would be that would be good Mary, item number nine in, um, members newton stewart flood protection scheme update on the flood protection scheme in sparland bridge this report provides members with details of progress and the updated timetable for newton stewart flood protection scheme and the replacement for sparland bridge uh, i believe there's going to be a video of something is there it won't work Okay, thanks thank very much. Um, I'd just like to confirm that I was not the jogger. I was going across that, that first part of the bridge. Um, <laughs> Director, have you got anything to add? Uh, nothing to, to, to add, Chair. Uh, just to say that that was an introductory video of, of uh, the proposals for Sparling Bridge. Uh, and uh, I'll hand over to my colleagues uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Unless you've got anything to add? Nothing to add, Chair. Uh, yeah, um, I think as um, James alluded to earlier, we were notified this morning that we were successful in the funding bid to Sustrans, so they'll be um, match funding the design work, which is all the work that's led us to this point, and we are submitting a further bid this week for the main construction costs. Um, the upshot of, of all this is the original idea was to put the old Sparling Bridge back into place, um, 
by working with the, the community and the elected members and the decision to, to design a, a full new bridge, it's likely that the final costs for the council will be less than putting the old bridge back because the match funding will mean our contribution is, is less than fully fully putting the old bridge back in. So it's been a you know a really good project. Okay, thank you, member. Thank you, Chair. And yes, I'm really delighted to see this report and the project moving forward. I just want to ask, in terms of 3.12, it actually it highlights that the um, the timescales are exceedingly tight. And certainly on 3.14, it does state that you're only allowing four weeks for the for the appointment and or for the tender process and the appointment of a contractor. Is four weeks a realistic? Time scale for that. In terms of my second question on the wooden panels that have been put on at the request of the Cree Valley <coughs> Community Council, I'm just looking for some reassurances that those wooden those wooden panels are actually going to last. You know, Dumfries and Galloway and around Newton Stewart, we have very high levels of damp, and my concern would be that those those bits of wood might rot quite quickly. And certainly at Kudokhtri Visitor Centre, where there has been wood installations put in, you can see how quickly the wood actually rots. So I'm just looking for some reassurance that that's not going to happen and that we have in place some form of way to ensure the longevity of this. Because I would hate for us to be sitting in a couple of years' time where those wooden panels have maybe started to degrade already. Thank you. Um, yep. Um, with regard to the first point on procurement, we have met with our procurement colleagues um, and what we'll be planning on doing is putting a, a notice out in advance of the, the tender going up for procurement so we can shorten the procurement window so we are trying to keep a, you know, a, a, those time skills the best we can. Um, and with regard to the wood panels, we, we pointed out in 3.9 in the report that will will ensure that the timber panels are designed such a way to minimise any any damage, and we'll be working with colleagues from from other councils who've included timber within their bridges to sort of learn from from anything they've done previously as well. David, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would like to pass on Cree Valley <coughs> Community Councils. Thanks for the work that's been done in this bridge, yeah, um, and they appreciate. The, um, the input that they've given has been taken consider uh, has been considered. The, um, I think the timber panels just soften the whole bridge, yeah, and I think that was yeah when you, when you could see it on 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 the the, sh the film show there. You know, it actually it it's quite an iconic structure, and I think that's what we set out to achieve. So, yeah, thank you very much, Alistair, and your team, yeah, for a very positive outcome. Okay, Jim. Thanks, Chair. I'm very pleased to see a much more substantial bridge than its predecessor. Uh, I'm quite sure the cyclists and pedestrians uh, will feel quite a bit safer going across this bridge than they do crossing the current Cree Road Bridge. Also, it's nice to see that lighting has been put on the mini gap side because that was a bone of contention eh, with the, the, the previous bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Graham? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I would like to thank the officers for their flexibility um, because I had I made fairly robust comments when the, I had an assurance at the last EEI committee that there would be, on the Tuesday, that there would be consultation with the local community and on the Thursday the planning application went in and obviously there had been no consultation in that couple of days but I would like to thank them for their flexibility and their willingness to listen to the local population and we have, I think we've achieved a very nice outcome at the end of the day and as, 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 as other people have said it will be a big improvement on what was there before Having said that, what was there before was put together very cheaply, a lot cheaper than this one, but it did look at it at the end of the day. But uh, I would like to thank the officers anyway, because I think they've done a superb job in this. Thank, thank you very much, 
Okay, um, um, members will go to the recommendations. 2.1 is to note, 2.2 is to agree, and 2.3 is to note. Agreed? I'm going to take one more one more uh, report and then it'll be time for, for lunch. Um, this one is item number 10, which is Harbour Setting of Fees and Charges 2018-19. This report seeks members' approval to fees and charges for the Harbour Service following the consultation with the Harbour Subcommittee on the 25th of January 2018. And the infrastructure manager will take any questions unless you've got anything to add to it, Director. Uh, nothing to add to the report, Chair. Thank you. James? Nothing to add to the report, Chair. Thank you. Members? Ian? Chair, we've got 10 years, but I just, this Harbour report is in front of us, so I thought we might have seen something to do with Annan. We, we talked about the full council. So when we've got to see the report, it says we've got to bring Annan back into, into the authority of the council. When we'll see that report, Chairman? Yes, there, there was reference uh, in the, the leader's speech and uh, in, in the budget about work to be done. It, on, was, cl it was within the recommendations, Chairman, for absolute clarity. Pardon? Sorry? Just we we all got a piece of paper, the budget and his recommendations, it was contained within that, is my understanding, that we'd get a report back outlining that the Annan Harbour being brought within the control of Annan. Well, no, you're going to get a report back about the Annan Harbour and where it sits. It's not, not brought, brought, brought back within the control of the council, it's where it sits and what the, what the outcome's going to be. Not brought back within the council, but that's a potential. All right? Let's be, let's be clear on that particular thing. So let's, the report for this is Harbour setting a fees and charges, not Annan Harbour. That will be something that comes in a, a, a report uh, later on in, in, in the year. And it will come because there will be discussions with infrastructure and all that type of thing. But this is not for this report. It will be in a later report in there. So, so uh, anything you add? I suppose the only chair then is it at the next committee or maybe the committee after that, maybe at the latest for clarity? It will be when the report is ready and went through its usual process. Um, thank you. Um, just on the landing fees, uh, but I'm particularly about Kubri, I'm glad to see that they're I mean, they've gone up, on that, but I, I would not like to see them go up much more at the moment because it's a pretty precarious industry and Kukubri needs its scallop fishing and I'm glad to see that there's no further increase in that. But with regards to the berthing fees on the marinas, I just wonder why we don't charge more if there's a waiting list and, you know, because what you don't want is it to, to, to be relatively, not cheap, but well, relatively cheap, and therefore people keep them just for if in case. And there's people that need, really would like to get onto the, onto the berths and can't. And I wonder if we're creating a problem by not, in, by not increasing the fees. James? Yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, just going back on that, I mean, we increased the fees, I think, 16% uh, two years ago. Uh, we're looking to increase them a further 10%. Um, I think we will look to increase them year on year. That's significantly above inflation. Um, I would, I don't know if I would use the expression until they squeal, but, um, but, but yes, it's not a core council service providing a marina facility and we should be looking to, to work to the market. But, but at the same time, we should also be looking to, um, encourage people into that kind of leisure pursuit and not price them out of it. So, you know, small yachts and things like that should be encouraged to go there. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, it's, it's all our landing fees, and I'm, I'm quite comfortable with the, the percentage. Uh, I'm just sort of, it brings to mind questions about, here we are, 2018, world of digital technology, uh, broadband and Wi-Fi and all the rest of it. Um, how do we establish what the gross value is when it's landed? In terms of, um, so the, this, for example, scallops landed at at uh, Kukubri, yeah, we, we get the value from the processing plants and that's what determines our value back. So is that, so it's a retrospective valuation based on what the processing factory processes and then you work backwards to then charge the fee for what you calculate was landed? Is that what you're saying? So my understanding is, Councillor, we have, um, we obviously know the amount that's landed um, and then we get the information back from the processors in terms of what they're selling this on uh, at. And I guess that will vary depending on the market at the time. Um, 
So do we know the weight? How do we measure the weight of the landing? Do we do we do, we do that as the Harbour Authority? How does that happen? The the the, the fishing vessels and the masters provide that information to us. So we don't we don't sit on the quayside and you know weigh the amount of material coming in. I mean, in in some respects, and in, in fact, at Kubri we have a much more control because we have staff on there all the time. But in other harbours, we rely on the honesty of the fishing fleet. So small amounts of uh, fish being landed at, say, Port William or Isle of Whithorn would be reliant on the, the the masters of the vessels could determine what they landed. So. I mean, okay, well, that opens up a whole other range of questions, but um, so we, we, we have no real way of verifying what the actual, uh, or we don't currently have a way of verifying what the, the landed weight is other than the, the good, honest word of our local um, skippers, if you like. I think that would be correct, uh, particularly in our smaller harbours, but we're also talking about values. We need to balance up that against values of how much it would cost to supervise fully the landings for small amounts of of landing. I'm 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 not disagreeing with you. I'm I'm I'm, I'm I suppose I'm looking. I don't want to be uh, smart here, but I'm looking for a point. Have you a suggestion to change this, perhaps? I, I think I'll probably catch up with you offline about that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, we'll go to the recommendations. In we we'll ask to note two point one and agree two point two. Members, I did, I did say we'd go for lunch, but I think there's only one um, in, in um, yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Which is number 11, which is Dumfries Gull Project. Gull Project. This report informs members of the progress on the current nest and egg removal project and asks members to agree the Urban Gull Task Force report, which will form the basis of further report to committee later this year. The Environmental Health Manager is here and will take any questions on the report. Director, you got anything to add? Uh, nothing to add to the report, Chair. Thank you. Greg, anything to add? It's only really a small thing. I brought this up before. Uh, it's not about the project itself and its success rate and such like, but I mean, we use methods in, in the Annan area, which I felt were every bit as effective, but a much lesser cost, and we should really keep that on our radar. Tommy. Thanks, Chair. It, it, it's really, it, it, when you look at the report, it's really a, a good news story and a bad news story. I'm looking at the, the people of Dumfries quite rightly now are finding a way forward with the problems we have with goals, which they've had for many, many years. So they deserve that. We, but way back in September, I, I was told that the investigation was being done in the Stranraer area because, as you know, we have many complaints. Nothing has come forward as yet. It tells me in this report that you're looking at areas out with, out, out, out with Dumfries to, to assess the problem. This is from getting a report away back in September to now still talking about assessing it. I think things have gone a wee bit further than that. And I think a wee bit of urgency has to be given to the, the problem in Stranraer. Thank you. Steve. <clears throat> Chair, um, certainly um, I think we're not aware of there being a significant issue within Stramra and really the, the reason for delaying bringing something forward is that really that's something that will need to be looked at in the context of the future of, <clears throat> that will need to be looked at in the context of the future of the project in Dumfries and going back to the comment that Councillor Carruthers just made, I think now is the time actually to take a, a slight step back uh, and and do a review of where we're going in the longer term with the with the project in in Dumfries and in particular looking at the at how um, resource intensive uh, or how we could improve its efficiency and at the same time looking at the demands and requirements in other parts of the region um, where we are uh, aware possibly of um, other problems existing. Bearing in mind that we are a coastal region, um, so it's to be expected that, that we will have issues with gulls in, in many of our uh, communities. It's a question then of the extent to which that becomes a, a real problem uh, within the local community. And you'll see 
chair in the, the report of the task force, <coughs> the gold task force, which is the appendix um, to this report, um, it categorises, it captures and categorises all the, the complaints that we've received in relation to Dumfries and Dumfries Town Centre. And, there's, and you'll see there's quite a considerable breadth of complaints uh, and there's quite a considerable number of complaints. And that, that's certainly not something that's replicated uh, in other parts of the, of the region and probably explains why um, this project emerged uh, some 10 years ago as being focused on, on Dumfries because that, there was the evidence there in terms of that was the that was where the real issues were being experienced in terms of um, noise, aggressive behaviour, nesting activities, um, the kind of the, the foraging for food and some of the impacts that that was having on people's um, use of the town centre, for example. We're not seeing um, issues like that getting reported to us in, in other parts of the region, but we, we'll cover all of that in, in the further report. But it, it's really got to be seen in a strategic context about where we're going where we think we should be going with the, the Dumfries project and taking the opportunity to look at if there are issues elsewhere, what can be done to address them. Don, may I come out? Yes, Chair. Clearly there are issues elsewhere. Clearly they have been reported previously. It's as if uh, they didn't know about the problem. So we're dealing with Dumfries and, oh, and incidentally we'll have a little look at the other little towns in the in the region as well. There is a major problem here. If he wants to come along and sit in my surgeries this weekend, he can hear the, what the people's got to say about it. There is a major problem there. So what happened to the report that was coming in September? It's, everything seems to have been delayed. I mean, I, I am grateful for everything that has been done for Dumfries. The people of Dumfries deserve it. But so do the people of Stringra. Well, just, Chair, just to reiterate, we're certainly not aware of a major problem. Um, <clears throat> well, that's not, we don't have any evidence of reported complaints coming to our services from members of the public. Uh, I'm aware of, a, of, of one or two individual complaints concerning specific buildings, but nothing like the scale um, that we have experienced in, in Dumfries, for example, and clearly to commit a significant resource intervention, which is what would be required if there was a major problem, um, requires an evidence base for us to bring back to this committee to get uh, a strategic decision. Okay, there's a, there's a further report coming back anyway. I do believe there are some issues in Sunra that are going to be mentioned in that report with, with regards to the Ryan Centre and places like that, where, where there are some nesting gulls that are, could easily be um, moved. John, you want to come in? Uh, it's just that uh, I know about, about five, six years ago, we were getting lots of complaints in Dumfries about the town centre, uh, the gulls attack, attacking down to get food thrown away, like, and there certainly has been an improvement in the town centre. Cause I don't think I had one complaint for the public last, uh, last year, but we were getting them, a couple of years ago, we were getting them in the outlying, er outlying areas, but now I think the public realise they've got the... They know that they can get in touch with the council and get the eggs removed, and that seems to have certainly stopped the complaints, so a lot of the complaints as well for the outlying areas. But I still think if it's a success in Dumfries, it should be targeted elsewhere if we're getting the same complaints. Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> Just following on from what John was saying, obviously table two on page 122, shows that although numbers are now falling overall across Dumfries, one of the big problems has been we've displaced the uh, goals from the town centre to the town edge. And it says in uh, 316, uh, numbers approaching 100 breeding pairs were nesting on a single building at Heath Hall Industrial Estate. And I am getting complaints, obviously not at the moment, but I will be getting complaints about the noise, particularly from the, uh, the seagulls in Heath Hall. So to what extent are we working with the owners of these uh, buildings in uh, Heath Hall, given that all we're doing basically to a large extent is chasing these goals from one uh, area to another and just shifting the problem rather than solving it, certainly in the, uh, the outline parts? It's a, a problem we do recognise and we've raised it with the, the Gull Task Force. Uh, the difficulty we've got at Heath Hall is that hangar, we, ca we can't get the contractor onto it, it's unsafe. We were out again yesterday with 
the council's own uh, health and safety team to look at that particular building. Uh, uh, there's no way that they would allow us to put anybody up there for, for safety reasons. So you will see in the, in the report that we are looking at other methods that we can trial. Uh, Ian's mentioned uh, methods that have been using elsewhere. Uh, we already euthanise uh, chicks um, when we're, we're taking them at certain ages. So perhaps we have to look at other ways that we can uh, deal with these problems. We'll go to the recommendations then. We're asked to note. Sorry, Stephen. Well, it was just a, a, a partially amusing comment about um, d did the task force stick to the boundaries of the official town centre as per the LDP, or did they go out with that to look at girls <laughs> and crossfield mills, for example? But that was all it was. We'll not be asking for any emails or that sort of thing like that. So well, as a recommendation, we'll ask to note 2.1, agree 2.2, agree 2.3, note 2.4, and note 2.5. Agreeing, Ian? Absolutely fine with that, Jim. I just wonder, because you mentioned the report coming back, it's looking at maybe a wider review, how do we tackle this potentially in other settlements? If it, if it becomes a problem and it's evidence-based, when will we actually see that report? Is it in, again, just... a report coming back anyway, no? Yeah. When is that, when is that due? I think the the short term priority for the staff is the is dealing with the yeah. is dealing with the current um, nesting and breeding season. So it's likely to be after the summer before we actually bring the report back because the okay. report will contain recommendations for next for next season. Yeah. Okay. So so we're looking what September October time. Yeah. September October time. Okay. Right, uh, members, before before we go into to lunch. Um, uh, uh, the next one's any other business. Um, Andrew used to send us an email about lobbying, um, and, and the, 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 the basics of it was on, on the lobbying on the Trunk Road network. And the leader of the Fish and Galloway Council wrote to transport ministers on the 4th of December, and there will be a, a, a sort of piece of paper coming round for each of you um, to have a look at over, over, over lunch. Um, Following a request from the EI committee at their meeting on the 21st of November, the leader wrote to the Transport Minister. The Transport Minister responded on the 10th of January 2018, acknowledging the Council's desire to have investment in major trunk roads within Dumfries and Galloway. And the Minister has also advised that he would be happy to meet with the leader when he is next in the region. The Minister further advised that the review of the National Transport Strategy and update of the Strategic Transport Projects Review STPR2 will provide the opportunity to consider the important contribution that transport infrastructure projects will play in delivering a sustaining economic growth and aspirations set out in the Scottish Government's economic strategy. And Transport Scotland have now secured consultants to carry out the South West Scotland Transport Study and Council officers are involved in that process. Um, the, the, the briefing is there for you to read members. Hope that answers your question, Andrew. Um, there is no sort of decision to be made on this. This is just a, a briefing update. We'll have lunch, and then when we come back, we'll then have to go into private session with the three uh, reports that are actually there. Is that okay, folks? It's okay, so can we come back for um, five to one? Yep. Welcome back. This is the exam item, so we need to consider adoption of resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 50A, 4, and paragraphs 6, 9, 12, 13 of part 1, of Schedule 70 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. Can we agree that? Thank you. We're going to the first. The first.